meeting is now being recorded. It's a little bit more uh, productive sometimes to think about what a, a negative user experience is. And if I were able to, I'd show you, of course, the famous uh, Jerry Seinfeld video where he goes to uh, get a car from a car rental agency that he's reservation at. Of course, they don't have the reservation for him. He, of course, very, you know, it's very lippy, Seinfeldy in a way, and talks about, you know, how to uh, take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. Of course, he's very dissatisfied with that user experience. Well, we've all had those. And all this, how many of us have gone through this situation um, where we have to make a, a password for, for a particular bit of software or a new application? And we go through, and of course, they need, as you see, 12 characters. One of them needs to be a Russian Cyrillic and some sort of symbols and combinations. I won't lie, even with the momentum conferencing software, I probably had to type in about 30 passwords. And these are all these user experiences that we have on a, a daily basis. A lot of them can be quite negative. Conversely, a lot of them can be really positive. I think when we go to Costco and return things, or I know when I take my kids to the Four Seasons, they take such good care of us that we actually become almost unpaid advertisers for that user experience because we have to go and talk about those an awful lot. When you think about the positive user experience, if we were in a, uh, a conference situation right now, or a workshop situation, what I'd want you to do is think about an, extending, uh, an outstanding customer service experience that you've had or user experience that you've had. Think about what made that experience so positive for you um, and, and think about who did you tell about it because with both of the negative user experiences, we tend to amplify those experiences. Then ultimately think of that one word that you would use to describe that experience for you. So if you could kind of close your eyes and think about that really positive user experience that you've had, and I've done this with people in the past, they come up with words like this. You know, it was memorable, it was painless, personalized, satisfying. And when you think about those user experiences, wouldn't it be great if we applied and had people talk about the experiences that they had at our school in that way? If they talked about the experience of school being memorable, if parents talked about the experience of registering their kids at our schools as seamless and painless, or if kids talked about their courses that they were intuitive, personalized, and satisfying, and ultimately enjoyable. And I think that's the opportunity that we have. IDEO is a famous design company in Northern California, and I love what they say about touch points. They talk about us being able to consider every product touch point as an opportunity to surprise, delight, and deliver benefit to our users. And I wonder if we in education can think more about those particular touch points that we have with all of our parents, our, our students, and our teachers in our schools as an opportunity to delight and deliver benefit to them. A lot of the times when I talk to different groups about it, it's very frustrating because we have so many things going on in our lives. We have the new curriculum that's coming in, which is very exciting but very demanding as well. We've got different policies, and we have new learners, and we have marking, and, and we have helicopter parents. And they're not just helicopter parents. They're sort of, you know, Apache helicopter, Black Hawk down parents that are coming at us guns a blazing. And, and in the midst of all this, we're supposed to try and figure out these innovative ways to try and do things. And in the end, I think what we all get back to is that we want to do these sorts of things, that we want to create these touch points that delight, but we just, how do we do it? And I think over and over, I used to be one of these people that said, you know, think outside of the box and, and, and make these sort of uh, winning statements like, you know, innovation begins with a question. And I, I, I used to think that. And, I should change my tune on that because I think we really need to think inside of the box. I don't think there's a person on this uh, podcast this morning that thinks that there's more money that's coming to the education system or that there's more time. There's, you know, whether there's testing or bored kids or whatever it is, this is the world that we live in. These are the parameters that we live in. And more importantly, we need to think inside of the box. And so this concept of fruitful innovation that I've been speaking about lately is, is really the, the co-creation of, of solutions to issues that contravene our co-developed vision. But here's a key part is embracing the parameters that impact our day-to-day -day operations, not running away from them and not, not really getting mad about them. We just have to deal with them and work through them. And this is where I believe innovation begins. You know, and I, as I said, I used to say innovation begins with a question. I really think it starts before that. I think it starts when when parameters around us begin to become noticeable to us. 
we don't even know that we're in a box as far as I'm concerned until we're really starting to try to get out of it. So um, frugal innovation is also born out of an Indian term called jugad, which is uh, it's just like a life hack. It's a low-cost fix. It's a simple workaround, or it's a solution to any problem in an intelligent way. But frugal innovation is also fed by stuff such as uh, in a great book, if you haven't read it, by Robin Chase called Piers Inc., and Robin was the founder of Zipcar, and what Robin told us at a conference last year was that the average American spends, or North American spends, between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars on their vehicle. The average American also spends about forty-five total minutes in their car per day. So when you think about it, we have this expensive and depreciating asset that sits idle in our parking lots or in our in our driveways for for over twenty-three hours a day. And so you can envision parking lots that look like this filled with cars. And when I see an image like this, I also see an image like this. And I wonder how much unused capacity that we have in each of our schools. I wonder how much unused capacity we have in our classrooms, how much unused capacity we have in our faculty meetings and district meetings. And you know what? If we were to walk into our parking lots with a big bin of Starbucks, I think we could find a whole lot of unused capacity in our parent community as well. And I think there's a way that we can utilize that a little bit differently. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, I think when we are trying to move kids from the reality or where they're at to the vision and where they want to be, and, and as you know, I uh, some of the districts around the province on things like the body part jigsaw and developing attributes of a graduate, and, and many of us have done those sorts of things in our schools and our districts. And I think that distance that lies between the reality where our kids are at and where we want them to go is, is ultimately called the experience of school. And I think that's the opportunity where we can apply the principles of design and the principles of user experience with, uh, with a lot of the stuff that we do in our schools. I think we can, re we can change or build upon the idea of user experience and think of our learner experience. And ultimately, that's the experience that our students and our educators and our parents have with our schools and school districts. And of course, there's a number of other user groups that I'm not listing in that situation. But I think if we really focused on the experiences that these, these three groups had in our schools and our districts, I think we make a significant change to the experience of school. And there are so many experiences that we have, aren't there? When we think about graduation ceremonies or how people interact with our websites, Websites is an interesting one to me because on many occasions I've found that when I've actually sat down with parents who are probably some of our biggest users of our website and asked them ultimately what they want, number one, they're surprised because no one's ever really asked them. And number two, I'm surprised at how little they actually want, things like the address of the school, the phone number, how to contact teachers. And yet we continue to make websites, just using that as one example, that are more organization-centered than learner-centered. And only recently, as, as becoming a parent and a consumer of our current system, did I finally understand what it feels like when you actually get a report card home for your child. It's a very different experience than when I used to publish C plus S and have a good summer for my students in Biology 11. I never really thought about what those user experiences were. I think we can define some high-impact experiences because there are so many experiences out there that we could try and change. For example, we might have a series of, of beautifully uh, artistically created garbage cans and have a wonderful campus that is free of garbage, but in terms of that having the opportunity to impact the learning environment of our school, as much as that's a laudable goal, I don't necessarily think sit and toil on each and every one of those experiences. So I define high impact experiences as ones that have the potential to significantly impact the culture and or the learning environment of our school. Right now, I'm attempting to write a book about the redesigning the experience of school, and within that, I think about this high-impact experience matrix, and I'll take our students, our parents, and our educators, and start to think of what are high-impact experiences that if we changed, we could significantly change the culture and learning experience of our school. We might fill it out in this way, and you might fill it out differently. But for our students, it's maybe it's the classroom, teacher relationships, and extracurriculars. I'll let you read it. For our faculty, maybe it's faculty meetings, professional development, and collaboration time. When you think about these, here's to me whether you've nailed the high-impact experience or not. I think about if I had a student 
at my school currently who is speaking to a prospective student, would I want them to say something like this? Our classroom learning environment is amazing. Our teachers care about us so much, and our extracurricular opportunities are absolutely off the map. Would that message from a student, not from us, because no one believes us, from a student when we are there, if that message from that student went to a prospective student, do you think they'd want to come? And conversely, if we had a prospective teacher that was thinking about coming to our school or district, and one of our current educators said, our faculty meetings are a disaster, our professional development is scattered, and collaboration time, we don't really have it. Conversely, do we think a staff member would want to come to our building or our district? If these are the types of things, when you say those sentences, that you feel it would really make a difference, then you've probably nailed the high-impact experience. We're going to follow one of these through very quickly, because I think I only have, if I can check here, about, I've got 11 minutes left. We'll follow one of these through and just see how to apply the principles of learner-centered design and really make a difference, I think, to some of these activities. But when I look at these nine different things, and let's say you come up with different ones, whatever you put in the matrix would be fine. If we were to impact one of these things or two of these things every year, imagine in two or three years that we altered six, seven, eight, nine high-impact experiences at our school. I think that we would have redesigned the learning experience that our kids were having. So if we follow professional development through, the question that we ask ourselves is how can we co-create these high-impact learning experiences for our educators? Because, again, going back, we're using our educator as our learner group. How can we co-create these experiences in all of the classrooms and tasks that we want for our students? Well, I think there's a way to do it. I'm proposing a model of learner-centered design, which is really a takeoff of human-centered design, and a number of models that exist out there, but none to me that have really been applied in a way to education, to redesign the learning experience. And it kind of looks like this. It's a five-step iterative process that's cyclical, and it's, it's the five eights, I call it, appreciate, co-create, ideate, iterate, and proliferate. I believe that using a model like this consistently with our learner at the center, we can make some significant differences. Learner-centered design puts the people in our communities, which I'm going to define as our students, educators, and our school community uh, consumers that you serve at the center of your design process. And I think it does three things. First of all, by involving people in those solutions you do, you will create better solutions. The odds that as a single person or maybe as an admin team, uh, that through the process of solution, I guess we're going to be able to create something that meets the needs of everyone around us without involving them, I think is quite low. Second piece is that it's going to build capacity. The idea that the more we get our communities, again, students, teachers, and, and parents, involved in this process, we're going to build their capacity to solve problems. But I think most importantly, when we're doing something meaningful, when we're doing meaningful work with people, I think we develop meaningful connections with people, and I think that's an ancillary benefit that we can really build on. The first step is appreciate, and I think it's really important that we actually sit with the group that's impacted and, and develop a true appreciation of their current experience. And we'll, we'll talk about the idea of who before do. I know that many of us have, have probably seen the TED Talk called Start With a Why with a Sinek, and it's, it's quite compelling when he talks about um, Apple and how Apple starts with, with a why, and that's their central purpose. And by starting with the why, that's really going to convince people by their products. I just think that we can go a level deeper than that because the one thing I know about Apple, or any company for that matter, is they always think of who their target market is. And the reason I think that we need to think about the who whenever we're designing something is that why piece can be very different for someone who's embracing change versus someone who hasn't. So we really have to get down to the nitty-gritty of who do we need to have involved in terms of solving a particular problem. So an innovation rule is think of who you're solving the problem for and then do two things. Number one is to listen to them, but number two is to observe them when you're creating that solution. And if we think about professional development in terms of our uh, high experience metrics, if we want these engaging PD, PD activities, we have to, ask, have to ask our teachers how they invest and think about how we would learn best in that situation too. And then we have to observe the typical session. Recently, we worked with local high schools who said that they wanted us as our design team here in, in where I work to develop a professional development on productivity learning. Now certainly we could 
we could have done a prescription with any sort of diagnosis, and we could have made up a, a, a PD on, on PBL. But instead, what we chose to do is we chose to go in and treat them as clients, and we interviewed 10 of them, 10 of the staff members and their principal, and they told us that they want a PBL experience that was completely immersive, that had lots of meat to it in terms of the actual theory behind PBL, but one of their challenges was that they weren't able to engage teachers all the time in professional development, and they were quite honest with us about that, but that's what they if we would have just went in and made up any sort of PBL lesson, we likely would have ignored all three of these things and really done what we thought was best. That's the opposite of learning center centered design. That's, more, that's what's called organization centered design. The second piece in this model is co-create. And that's really important, and I've heard this earlier when I was talking to Woody about flattening hierarchies and empowering the group. The one thing about experiences is that everyone is an expert in their own learner experience, and I think we have to acknowledge that. One of the things that can happen to us as principals or district leaders is immediately when we come into the room, people defer to our opinions. We have to make every attempt to, do, to decrease that hierarchy. And what we did was we made sure we sat with that group at that particular high school and really worked through what their learn best one looked like to think about how we could make something that suited their needs. The one point I want to make, though, is, is when you're getting into these conversations, it doesn't just mean that we throw things out the door and we just do yoga or whatever people want to do in the room. You have to ask the right question, which is, how do we learn best? It's not about what we want to do, because clearly the principal on the team wanted to do something about project-based learning. We just wanted to make sure that we did something that met their needs. The next piece is ideate, and that's where we have to come up with neat ideas that are going to start to meet those needs of that school. I'm lucky enough that I work with a design team here at uh, the Henry Group Center in Kamloops, and we started to come up with ways that we could meet their needs, immersive, it's PBL-based, but also to increase the accountability. At this point, we had to ask ourselves some great questions, and a fabulous book is by Warren Berger, where he talks about really cool questions. So, for example, rather than saying we need to make a better toaster, he talks about how can we make the toasting of bread unforgettable. One makes us think about the toaster. The other makes us think about the experience. And with, with this group, we want to co-create an immersive learning experience that matches their learn best wins. That's the question we needed to ask us, and it ignited all sorts of different brainstorming ideas. Once we came up with a bunch of ideas, we had to test them out, and that's the iteration phase. And one of the things I love is what Saul Kaplan at the Business Innovation Factory said to us last year when I was at a conference in Rhode Island. He said, get up off the whiteboard and get into the real world. And one of the things I think that's really important in education is for us to do and then know. Do it and know we're likely going to make a mistake and then know afterwards that we're going to make it even better. And what did we do? You know what we want the one person that's going to keep everyone accountable in the room? Grandma. So what we did is we did a project-based learning thing where we had a client-based activity and the clients were senior citizens from the community. In terms of accountability, it was very high. We've all seen this with Austin's Butterfly. We had to try this a couple of times first, but ultimately what we did is we made an experience for them that met their learn best wins. And once you've hit it, that's when it's time to proliferate and get it out there. And the whole key to proliferate is to make sure that your measure of success is the experience, not the finished product. Just because you've completed a professional development day, that's the time to actively seek feedback to make sure that you met the needs of that person. Proliferate is a very organic word, and I think to me the idea that it's spread and worse once you've made that idea and put it out there is, is great. But one cautionary thing with sharing, when you're sharing something with other people, always make sure that they share it back if they've made it better. And in our connected society, there's no reason that we can't do this anymore. Over a beer-infused argument one night, a friend of mine said, why is there not a sixth eight? Those are the eight known as celebrate. And I think we have to be very cautious when we celebrate things. I think what we can celebrate is an excellent user experience. What we don't want to celebrate is just that we've completed something. And so it's really important. A great example of this was Blockbuster Video. And Blockbuster Video was very happy that they had this, this idea of you know, no late fees and all that sort of stuff. But in the end, someone came along that was really concerned with the user experience, Netflix, and Netflix then. And the idea here is that Blockbuster was celebrating their product rather than the experience their clients were actually having. And I think we will avoid that. I think
think we celebrate the learning experience and the meaningful connections that we've developed. And then we celebrate the fact that we've got another challenge coming. This is education, and it's always going to happen. And I think that we've increased our capacity to solve it by involving the learners and making it learner-centered the way through. So in closing, utilizing the learners we have in our schools, it, it just seems to make sense. And, and I think the challenge for us across British Columbia, and, and many of us are going through this right now, is how we use our learner groups to help you, to help us solve our problems and to help build that capacity and ultimately build the connection with the communities that we have. And I guess I, I really do believe this. I think we all are learning experience designers, and whether it's our faculty meetings, our PAC meetings, our district administrator meetings, if we're really attending to how people learn something best as opposed to just covering content, which we never would tolerate in a classroom, then why would we not want to do that at every possible opportunity that we could? Because the time that we spend on the front end in this situation is going to far away. And where do you want to spend your time? Do you spend your time planning and proactive, or do you want it to be reactive? So I think that's the key for us. So if you want to, to co-design learning experiences, hey, it sounds like a lot of fun, and, uh, and that's what I have for you today with 46 seconds left. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, your five-step plan there. Um, Woody and I here are together. Uh, we've just kind of tried to summarize a couple of the thoughts that you had there. I'm going to turn it over to Woody here. Thank you. Thanks for uh, engaging us with that uh, conversation around the user experience and how uh, the innovative piece works into that whole thinking around uh, how we increase capacity for just enriching the experiences for our students and our staff and our schools. I'm just curious about, as we go through the redesign of the curriculum, do you see some key things that we need to be aware of to really enrich that user experience for students and staff as we go forth into next year? Well, I think, you know, we've been, I think we've been uh, lucky to this point. With the two uh, days that we had, the additional professional development days, we actually spent a lot of time with teachers designing those days in advance. Um, and what we realized through that process is, is typically what we might have done is just um, put teachers into grade specific groups um, and then let them go with them. And what we recognized is after sitting with teachers who believe it, what a concept, and asking them what they needed, they needed more guidance than that. They needed to know the theory behind it. They needed to know some of the specific content behind it. So by actually spending the time with those people on the front end, um, I think it really saved us on the back end. I think it's going to be the same with parents. And one of the challenges that we're going to find in the fall, or I, I think this will happen around the province, is that there's going to be a lot of parents that have questions about this. And I think by going out and actually sitting with and maybe having and co-designing that learning experience for parents with a group of parents in advance, we're going to be able to meet their needs a lot better by sitting and understanding what their real questions are. I still believe that in education we have a bad case of solutionitis where we just want to solve problems without actually diagnosing what the actual issue is. So I think by sitting with parents, sitting with teachers, and sitting with our kids and really understanding what some of their questions are, I just think we can meet their needs a little better. So that's something that it's worked well with us with our teachers so far, and I think they've been very receptive to it. Now we've got to build that out to our parents. Great. Uh, just kind of piggybacking on that, Gail, um, certainly in my experience as a system, we're really good at one-way communication, and uh, you know, I think everybody agrees that co-creating is definitely uh, uh, helpful for our solutions. Um, do you have any suggestions, or uh, maybe I'll put it out to the group as well, but um, ways that people are engaging, parents in particular, in different conversations? I know for many of us, you know, we get the same number of parents or same group of parents out to a PAC meeting or to, to different conversations. So in looking at different ways and connecting with our community, do you, have you seen anything out there that you have found really effective or, um, or you know, innovative that way? Well, I think, you know, it's funny. Uh, I would agree with you that when we think about our, let's say, our, our PAC meetings, and, and maybe uh, some are better than others, but typically we would get, you know, 
maybe 10 parents, maybe less, maybe maybe a few more depending on the issue, uh, which doesn't necessarily represent our community. But I guess what, what I find is we end up just trying the same thing over and over and over again. And, you know, so I, I think about uh, Liz Bell, for example, who, uh, who I know used to have uh, coffee in the community and go out and actually try and sit where people are at and to understand some of the challenges, issues, and and strengths of, of her school community. I think it's the idea that if we keep doing the same things over and over, which I'm very guilty of doing myself, then it, it would be quite odd for us to expect any different result. I think, for example, our first parent-teacher interviews of the year, that is an opportunity for us when we get a lot of people in our building. How can we leverage that opportunity and really engage people in conversations, not just around the interviews that they're having with, with teachers, but with us? I think our parking lots are rich places. I have seen people, as I said, sit out in the parking lot with a giant Tim Hortons urn out there and just ask people to stop and talk for a few, a few minutes to start to get some feedback. But I think those are just a couple of examples of things where we, we just have to try some things that are a little bit different because, as you're saying, ultimately I think we would all agree that the same things that we've done have netted us the same results. I, I just think that there's, there's more ideas out there that we could try. Thanks for that. Uh, I think that uh, kind of wrapping up uh, here, the one thought that you, uh, out of many, was uh, the idea of sharing. And I think as, um, you know, our group uh, that's on here and our, our network of, um, of colleagues as they try different things to look for ways to share those, those out. And I think um, certainly, you know, everybody is trying different things uh, or, or wanting to try different things. And um, for all of us, we love to hear uh, how those work, uh, both the success and the struggle. Okay, yeah, I just have a, a question for you as we wrap up here, thinking about our association and making connections. What suggestions would you have for us as an association moving forward in terms of creating uh, those experiences for people to engage in dialogue? So how do we, we've tried, the, you know, the webinar approach that we're doing now is another, another innovative way to engage dialogue, but how do we as an association continue to push that forward uh, for our, our members around professional learning and engage them in, in dialogue. So if I can ask a question uh, to clarify the question. So what have we tried in terms of methodologies to engage the group in developing those solutions? And what I mean is, is so someone uh, came up with this idea of the, the webinar series, which I think is a very unique idea, a neat idea, but how do we go about developing those ideas? Like well, where do those ideas it, come from, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, and I think it started through our uh, collaboration with our professional learning reps. So we've tried to get feedback okay. from the field about what's working well right. in districts and what are the needs of districts. So we're trying to build that capacity within the context the principals and vice principals are working in and then also connect them outside to other uh, districts and different uh, members so that they can, they can hear and listen to each other on different ideas. Yeah, and I think I think that's a good start. And I think the other thing that we can we can do, Woody, I believe, is start to ask our members that question as well at uh, the local level. I, I just think that uh, I know that for myself, and I'm thinking of my own staff. I don't know that I necessarily uh, ask the right questions of people. I just sort of ask as a representative, for example, to maybe BCPPA meetings. And I use my own thoughts in that situation, and I just wonder if there's a way that we can try and get those the real hard conversations happening at the local level. You know, saying we do want to make a difference. The BCPPA does want to make a difference in terms of, of, of learning. Um, what are the ways that we can, uh, you know, sort of accomplish those learn best wins? So I think you know that's that's a real key to me is is what are the learn best wins for our principal groups given the parameters of, you know, there is no more time, there is no more money, and over the course of a given day, many of us feel like we're in, in, in the educational triage mode. And I, I think just to try and engage them in that chat, the process, I think is a start point for all of us. But I think even right now, uh, something like this, I think what you're doing is you're giving people a great opportunity. You guys have acknowledged the hour of the day, which I really love, which is before people are at work. I think we're fresh and, and ready to go in the morning. And, and you know, I think these will start to, to break outwards. And then, like, the key for me is, is what feedback are we getting after these events are over? 
and I think those will be those will provide us a little bit of uh, of um, sort of fruitful dialogue as well. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Kale. Uh, and on that uh, note, for our participants, you will receive a, a feedback survey both uh, on your user experience from the technology side, and then of course feedback on uh, on the topics we've been sending those out. Uh, I just wanted to thank Kale for his time and sharing his uh, his learning and thoughts on. Um, the uh, redesign of uh, the school experience. I want to thank all of our participants for joining us this morning. I know everybody has a, a busy day as we wind down here towards the uh, last few days of, of uh, both teachers and students in our buildings. And I wanted to remind everyone that next week is our last session. Uh, it will be starting at uh, probably about 7.45, and it will be with Dean Shiresky, who will present live from short course. So again, we're going to try something a little bit different. We'll have a, a live presenter in front of the short course participants and broadcast that out to our membership. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a great day, and uh, we will look forward to connecting with you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, everyone.